All right, um, the last talk of this uh, first session is by an exceptional researcher who is redefining the intersection between computer science and security. Professor Raluca Adapopa from the University of California at Berkeley. Now, her work in the field of cryptography and security has had a profound impact on how we safeguard data and privacy in an increasingly interconnected world. Um, her trailblazing research in secure systems and applied cryptography, including her groundbreaking work on the development of practical encrypted systems, has set a new standard uh, in the field. So please join me in welcoming a leading voice in computer security, recipient of the 2021 Grace Murray Hopper Award, a Tech Review 35 Innovators Under 35, and CCEL alumna, Raluca Adapopa. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, so I'm honored to be here and celebrate CCEL and Project Mac with you. Um, to celebrate the breakthroughs that happened in CISEL, to reminisce about the ways it influenced our careers. Um, I was here in undergrad, master, and PhD. So I've been here you know, for a long time and you know, starting a decade ago. So it's really nice to see in the room so many of my mentors, advisors, faculty collaborators. You guys look great. <laughs> you haven't changed all that much. Have I missed some CISEL breakthrough? In aging? A louder. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. All right. Um, so, can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. So, I'll speak louder. So, um, my first research project and my first paper was with Ron Rivest in a security of electronic voting. And I Thank you. All right, um, hopefully now it works better. Actually, just before my talk, I had to run to the bathroom, so I was really worried about being mic'd up. <laughs> so maybe it's good it didn't work for the first part. All right. So um, my first research project was in the security of elections with Ron Rivest, and I remember him sitting at his desk like, like in this picture and sharing with me a research problem he's very interested in. I was an undergraduate, so I was very eager to go ahead and solve it. So I worked for a couple of weeks very intensively on it, and I came back to Ron with what I thought was a solution. Um, to my embarrassment, Ron found a bug in it, so I really felt extremely, extremely embarrassed, but he was also so encouraging about the progress he saw in it. So I went back to the drawing board and worked really, really hard, and this time I came back to him with an actual solution, so that was our very first, my very first paper and my very first research experience. Uh, within security, I'm extremely interested in building systems with the help of advanced cryptography. So I fell in love with cryptography in Silvio's class, and a really key moment that I remember to this day was when Silvio convinced us to basically sell fake diamonds for real diamonds, the same price of real diamonds, as long as they are computationally indistinguishable. First experience doing system design, iterating through the design and implementation with this Barbara Liskov, again as an undergraduate, and going through so many iterations trying to meet the various constraints and goals, and finally, to our satisfaction, reaching to a place where we were happy with. All right, so equipped to these experiences from undergrad in CCL, I started my PhD in CCL. And then, ever since then, I was obsessed with this major problem in security. There's a recurring server compromise. We hear about you know, user records being stolen. It's, doesn't seem to stop. Why doesn't it seem to stop? Why does it continue? You hear about it all the time in the news. The reason is that there's an actually a fundamental reason. Servers have access to sensitive data. They can see, they can access it. Hence, any attacker breaking into those servers is going to get access to that data. And attackers are eventually going to break in. So the approach during my PhD thesis was to assume that attackers are eventually breaking in and be prepared even then. And 
the best way to be prepared is by having your data encrypted. Because if it's encrypted, then attacker steals encrypted data. If they don't have the key to decrypt it, they're not gonna know what the data is. So industry already was using encryption over the network in transit or at rest, but it was not using yet encryption during compute. And this is what was very important for closing this pipeline for having this end-to-end -end encryption, right? To always keep the data encrypted even when you compute on it. Again, this is very powerful because if an attacker breaks in into the server and steals the data, it's encrypted. Okay, but then how do we compute on this encrypted data? Even simple things like the user wanting to know what emails have been unread and fetch those emails, like checking this flag, is it read or unread? How do we compute on encrypted data? So at the beginning of my PhD, there was this amazing breakthrough in cryptography from Craig Gentry called fully homomorphic encryption. It basically enabled you to compute any function you wanted on encrypted data without decrypting it. So the user would send a function to, let's say, the cloud here, and the data was encrypted in the cloud, and the result would be, you know, the, the cloud could compute this function over the data without decrypting it and return an encrypted result that the user could decrypt. So this was very powerful but it was estimated to be a trillion times slower than regular computation. And what I wanted to set out to do is to build practical systems that can compute on encrypted data. So how do you do that? Then systems and advanced cryptography were two very you know, different disciplines. There's very little things happening at the intersection of the two. The researchers and systems were generally perceiving advanced cryptography as highly inefficient as a theoretical tool, and there was very little cross-pollination between these two areas. So I was very, the, the vision that I had to build a practical system and merge these two, kind of bridge these two areas, sounded, you know, to some extent unattainable. But I'm very, very thankful for my advisor, Nikolai, and for Shafi, in systems and cryptography for embracing this with me, for encouraging me in, you know, in, in my vision, and for providing an exceptional support throughout this journey. And soon thereafter, I was joined in my journey by super amazing mentors and wonderful collaborators, Hari, um, Franz, and on the cryptography side, Vinod and Yael. So I think this is something that was already touched a little bit already, the fact that in CCL, you know, you have a bold vision and you're not afraid to pursue it and you know, your advisors, mentors, you know, collaborators are supporting you and providing an exceptional support in that endeavor. So I'm very grateful for that. All right, so how exactly uh, did I bridge systems and, and cryptography? What did we do? Well, the very first observation is that if I'm going to take Let's take an encrypted database as an example. If I'm gonna put the whole database processing engine inside this en encryption, um, for example, to compute a query, the details of the query are not important, but if I put that whole processing functionality inside this one encryption scheme, then it's gonna be awfully expensive. So instead, the idea in our work CryptDB more than a decade ago was to really understand, first understand the system, look at the space of possible queries and functionalities, and to observe that there's actually a small number of building blocks that if you can support, you support a large class of these queries. And then the idea was to have an encryption scheme for each one of them. And because it's tailored for that operation, it can be very fast, okay? Then comes back again from the cryptography back into you know, systems techniques which are able to put this together to execute the query, so we had to think of Query rewriters, we had to satisfy different constraints that these encryption schemes have, but eventually plan a query into something efficient using these mechanisms. Okay. So CryptDB was really just the first step in this direction more than a decade ago, and there's still left a lot to be improved on having richer functionalities or stronger security. But the one thing that emerged, and I forgot to say that with this, the design was much faster. It was 27% slowdown over MySQL on uh, some existing benchmark queries. So this compared 27% with a trillion times slower. So this was much, much more practical. And I would say that the main thing that emerged from CredibE is this 
recipe for how to do this efficient co-design of systems and advanced cryptography for computation is understand the common system, a common system that's widely used, understand the building blocks, then design a tailored and efficient cryptographic primitive for each one of them, sometimes that requires heavy lifting, and then design the systems techniques that put them together and also you know, work with the rest of the system. Maybe you have to redesign the query planners or maybe you have to redesign your memory paging algorithm or whatnot. It could be, again, heavy lifting, but that basically results in the overall practical system. All right, so CryptDB initiated a you know, rich line of work in encrypted databases as well as inspired industry systems. Um, when you look at some of these follow-up works from others like AutoCrypt, Crypsys, MRCrypt, one thing we quickly realize is that for our follow-up work, we have to get more creative with the names. All right, um, so at UC Berkeley, with my students, we continued in this line of work that started in CCL, and we vastly improved both functionality and security. So now we're able to process even advanced, you know, rich data analytics, complex queries like the TPCH benchmark. We're able to do machine learning on encrypted data, even neural network processing. And in terms of security, we're able to have strong um, threat models like malicious security, even if an attacker actively tries to deviate from the computation and to protect against indirect leakage through the memory. So these were a number of our works in, in this direction. And you'll notice that we got more creative with the names. So Waldo, Elsa, Dory, we went the Disney route. Because for as long as Disney is in business, probably won't run out of names. All right. Um, so there's really two mechanisms at the core of this work. One was leveraging something called secure multi-party computation, very powerful cryptographic tool that um, because of the distributed trust model it is in, and because of um, the interactive nature is harder to you know, make practical, but through, again, systems heavy lifting, we were able to uh, design a stack to make these systems practical. So we even brought these systems to GPU support, and which provided 10x improvement. We even rethink the, rethought the system stack um, for memory paging. And also, we develop frameworks for own experts to use this. So they don't have to have any expertise and can just use this technology. Now, recently, an exciting advance are specialized hardware for secure computation, uh, like hardware enclaves. And these have brought encrypted computation at speeds that are comparable with vanilla computation. Okay? Uh, and because now, Encrypted computation is so much more efficient, it enables some very exciting applications besides just strengthening security. And one application I'm very, very excited about is enabling collaboration among organizations that normally would not collaborate. So for example, healthcare providers have a lot of cancer data and they could learn a lot from training a joint model, but they cannot share this data because it's private, privacy regulations or concerns. So now, because they can share encrypted data and compute on the encrypted data, they basically don't see each other's data. So you share, but don't show, okay? So you can have all this amazing, you know, aggregate data for training and learn from each other's data and not show to each other the data. This is very powerful. So I'll show you a very quick demo of um, our open source MC2, which is based on the opaque work. Basically, what I'm gonna show you here on the top screen is a hospital encrypting their data, uploading to the cloud. These are three cloud servers on Azure, uh, running with the hardware enclaves, encrypted computation, and they're gonna be training a decision tree algorithm on the encrypted data of this hospital, and then it's gonna run classification as well. So very, very quick, um, I'm just going to show you the data set. Um, it's a cancer medical data set from UCI. Um, you, there's a, for each row, there's a user's medical data like age, BMI, glucose, insulin. So we're gonna be training a decision tree on this data. Uh, similarly, we have test data, and we're going to basically try to predict whether each user is likely to have cancer or not. So I'm just basically gonna upload this data to the cloud environment, and 
in this upload, the encryption happens. Okay, so the client is going to encrypt the data before uploads. So we can visualize what uh, data we have on the server side. This is in the cloud, it's encrypted. Again, the servers only see encrypted data at all times. Now on the servers, there's not gonna be much that you can visualize, so with the HTOP command, you're just gonna be able to see that the servers are utilized during training. And again, there's gonna be only encrypted data throughout. So we run the computation from the client side, you can see that the VMs are utilized. And as soon as the computation finishes, we are going to download it on the client side. Oh, you can see the results of the server. They're encrypted because again, the servers also see only encrypted results. Even intermediate results in the computation are encrypted. So now we can download them on the client machine. They get decrypted on the client and the client can, as soon as the download completes, we can visualize the results, right? And you can see that the results is here, patients and their ch probability of um, you know, incurring cancer, right? So this is a very, very simple example um, showing you how we can use you know, encrypted computation in the cloud. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up and say that uh, we've also worked on tech transfer, so Signal is using the techniques in two of our systems, Oblix and Snoopy. Um, IBM is using, um, is using Opaque for um, social care use case. We've also collaborated with banks. I have co-founded two companies in this space. Prevel was, is here in Boston, right, as I finished my PhD at MIT. Currently, Prevel is used by 800 enterprises in various space like defense, aerospace, aerospace education, finance. And Opaque is more new, it's in San Francisco. And Opaque commercializes exactly this idea of enabling collaboration for healthcare, financial, ad tech data without, you know, showing the data to each other, keeping it encrypted. We're also running uh, the largest in-person conference in this topic of uh, encrypted computation with Uncleaves. It's actually this week, later this week, so it's a very busy week. All right, so in my last 20 seconds, I'm gonna mention that, you know, it's really exciting to see how, you know, before cryptography and systems were such different domains and areas, but now it's an established area to bridge the two, and some of the people is, uh, you know, that are working on this are my own students who graduated in the past you know, seven years of me being a faculty and are now you know, professors in their own. Some other of my students are actually commercializing this technology as a testament to it being practical. Um, they have you know, three companies here. One of them, Alio, even has a uni unicorn valuation. Okay, so in conclusion, um, as a takeaway, encrypted computation provides a fundamentally stronger security um, because you know, even if the attacker breaks in, your data is protected, and it can be realized through a tight co-design of systems and cryptography. And the most important conclusion is that I'm very grateful to CCEL, my CCEL mentors and collaborators for my education. And I know that today you hear a lot of thank you, CCEL, but really, thank you, CCEL.